welcome back to Backseat Designers. My name is Gareth Millwood, and of course, I'm always here with my two favourite Danes, Frederick Olsen. Hello. And Trolls Plymouth. Hello. And before we go any further with today's topic, which is about elements of adventure games that aren't always in adventure games, we really should address the elephant in the room based on an argument that we just had in the green room. An eruption, really. An eruption, really. And we wanted to do this last week because last week would have been nearer to the date, but um, we kind of forgot. So we're doing it this week and we're doing it because this is somebody that's obviously had uh, a massive impact on the way this show has gone. Uh, And I'm glad that my coming into this show hasn't destroyed um, the legacy of that. But I think it's time, Trolls, we probably should sing the song. Yes, we should. Uh, we absolutely happy should. Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. To you. Happy, happy birthday, Eric Idle. What? Hey, what? Er- Eric Idle. Eric Idle. Oh, yeah. No, wait. No, no. Was... Oh. no wait. No. We're, we're, t- we're talking March 29th, right? People who yeah, are born on 20th? Yeah. Er, er, yeah, Eric Idle's birthday, yeah. Well, yeah, and Councillor Deanna Troy's, but no, no, Manowar, Manowar. I guess I've taken most of my shtick from Eric Idle anyway. No, 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 Manowar. No, the, the legendary uh, racing horse. He was born March 29th, 1917. He's, he's legendary. You've heard of him, surely. Is he named well, after no. the band or is the band named after him? It, it, the band is named after him. He was trained by Louis Feisel. He was ridden by Johnny Loftus, an absolutely amazing jockey. He was he was fantastic. I mean, uh, he 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 won. How many was it? He won like uh, uh, sixty out of uh, sixty one races or something. He's only had one loss. He's a he's a freaking legend. I don't know. When you mention bands in conjunction with horses, the only guy I can think of is Ian Watkins, and I don't want to do that. <laughs> No, I'm just I'm just looking it up now. He had he had an undefeated season of eleven straight wins, and he only lost once, and it was absolutely awful. Have you you, you must have heard of him? Well, well yeah, no, but it's, 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 everybody's heard of Man of War. Of course, he's one of the greatest horses of all time. I mean, his his stud record speaks for itself. I mean, the number of can, the number of titles that he won and his progeny won is is beyond compare. But I mean, Eric Idle. Oh, yeah. Man. Well, no, Eric Idle no, Eric Idle didn't no. win near as many uh, horse race prizes. Oh no no but but Manowar I mean I mean seriously I mean he I mean he sired so many uh winning race horses after that I mean he's fucked more horses than you, than any you know Kentucky farmer more I mean, horses he than the, Ian Watkins he, Yes I mean he 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 wow. produced I mean his his sireness produced more than 64 stake winners and various champions he just he just fucked his way to the top Manowar I mean happy birthday Manowar oh, Yeah I mean 2000 people War. turned up to his funeral so I mean he's you know, he, yeah he's obviously a legend He's obviously oh, yeah. the most important person ever to have been born on March the 29th. Hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, no question. No question. I mean, he did have that one lose, but uh, honestly, that was, that was the jockey's fault. I mean, back then they didn't have those, you know, uh, you know uh, horse cages that they keep them in. They just had this little fucking fence and, you know, the fucking jockey just, you know, swiveled him around and he started, you know, with his ass turned to the finish line. And then, you know, uh, of course he didn't win that one. He came very, very close, though. Look, Charles, I, d- I don't think you need to tell our listeners about Man of War. They obviously know about Man of War. It's just oh, sure, sure. We, yeah, but we I'm... wanted to bring that up. That was all. Oh, uh, absolutely. Well, uh, yeah. We're uh, doing this show in honor of Manowar. Yes. Happy birthday, Manowar. Born March 29th, 1917. Obviously, the most important person or thing or animal ever to have been conceived March 29th. And a huge impact on the show. Absolutely. Okay. Well, back, back to you, good sir. Oh. Well, af- after that, um, happy birthday, Fred. Oh. Um. <laughs> we were expecting kind of a bigger reaction, to be honest. Well, I, I, I liked it. I liked it. I was just uh, flabbergasted. <laughs> do you realize how long we've spent researching this fucking horse? <laughs> I, do, I, do, I do immensely appreciate the fact that you actually found a fucking horse. You know, not just a <laughs> fucking horse. That's not just an adjective connected to the fact that it's a horse, but the horse was actually fucking. In this case, it's a verb. So, yeah, I, I, I appreciate it immensely, guys. Thank you. We've, and uh, I need to look... the last... Well, I need to read up on my Manowar. reading about this horse. I need, I need to read up on my Manowar. I know Danny Kay died, died on my birthday. Uh, <laughs> maybe it was because the horse 
got a little too close. I don't know. Skelly. What happens, yeah, this, in, what happens in, to showbiz the stays in showbiz stays in showbiz. But really, thank you, guys. I, I'm, I'm, I'm honored. And uh, I hope Man of War is too. Yes. I'm sure he is. Well, this week we were going to be talking, and we still will talk, uh, about uh, sort of event, uh, 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 elements of adventure games that are kind of found in other games. And Trolls, this was your idea, so I want you to sort of briefly and succinctly describe what it is that we're going to be talking about. Oh, no, yes. now you've got it. No, 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 no. I, I'm, I'm <laughs> going to do it because I did that pre-show. I'm going to do it now. Right. Um, at least from my perspective, and feel free to disagree on this, both my two co-hosts and anyone oh, who's listening to this. We will. You're absolutely oh. right. And I, and I was wrong. That's, that's not me. Uh, <laughs> that is you. completely doctored that sample. No. That is you um, at a more salient point in time. <laughs> <laughs> Get fucked. Um, now, the point was that at the tail end of the 90s, uh, we were sort of moving away from adventure games. Adventure games were quote unquote dead. Um, and we started looking elsewhere 3D shooters, RPGs, uh, puzzle games, and all the sorts of stuff that wasn't adventure games. And they were in vogue for well over a decade until I. At least for my viewpoint, I can see adventure game elements start to creep into genres where they weren't expected to be found. Um, and that's that's the succinct. Um, and then, of course, we have examples of that. But that's the succinct uh, explanation of this week's topic. Hmm, right. Okay. That was well, pretty I think good. That makes sense. I, yeah, think, that, I think that was very good. That Thank makes you. very good Thank sense. <laughs> well, for me, I mean, the first the first element and the one that perhaps allows us to talk about the history of, of this a, is going to be pretty fucking engine. funny when we get to the fifth element. Oh, <laughs> God. <no. laughs> Boom. <laughs> I did like that. Film, was that? Yeah, me um, too. <laughs> yes. Uh, right. Do uh, carry Bezel, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Born March um, the 29th. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yes. Uh, Marina Sirtis, a happy birthday. Oh, yeah. Marina yeah happy Sirtis. birthday, Councillor yeah, Troy. Happy birthday, Councillor Troy. She's, Wait, actually, she actually, is actually way cooler than me. Actually, we, we looked up a lot of people born on March 29th, oh. but when we saw that fucking horse, we just went, no, nope, that's the one. Got to roll with the horse. <laughs> and the literally fucking horse. Anyway, the first yeah. element of possibly five um, that I think is probably worth bringing up, just because it's kind of the base element of adventure games and it gives us a starting point for talking about other things, is a story that you have some control over its progression. The, the things that you do actively then make the story move along. And, okay, you might be able to say that that's true of Mario Brothers if you want to, but I think there's something a little bit more about that kind of level of storytelling that you find in adventure games that you might find elsewhere well having so, a fleshed out story alone because mario is little more than a damsel in distress story and going way back you had computer games like tetris which had no narrative uh you know it was just you know just a series of puzzles that you had to solve basically in soviet well, russia even... there is no narrative so so <laughs> yeah sorry for uh I'll, I'll let you get back to your point but to go even but to go even uh, further back than, than what you're currently doing alone having a narrative in a game I would say uh, is, is, is an adventure game element you know let alone a narrative that the player has influence on well I think I think that's actually a very good point yeah I mean it's, it's yes. not just a, a story or a very basic kind of uh, MacGuffin for why you're there it's that that actual narrative so maybe one that might be worth bringing up then is Wing Commander which of mm, course cool. is not an adventure game, but one that you have some control over how it goes, um, branching story points, which is obviously something that not even all adventure games have, but certainly Wing Commander did. Um, and I'm sure that you two have plenty of other examples of games that are not adventure games that have that kind of thing going on. Well, I, I quite like the Wing Commander example, actually, because uh, not only... It, well, it is it is a flight sim, and that's basically the main game element of it. But when you're walking around uh, the ships and such, you have conversation options. You can interact with uh, with people. You have, like, not, not dialogue trees, but you have, like, uh, options of where you want the conversation to go. And that's very much an adventure element. I remember, uh, you know playing Wing Commander 3 for the first time, and yes, that was my first Wing Commander game, uh, playing that and going, well, I just want to walk around the ship. I don't want to get in the actual you know, fighter jet and start shooting people because I'm bad at it. I just want to walk around and talk to these people and watch Mark Hamill do his thing. Um, yeah. 
Ghosts. And, you know, other, other games have, have done similarly. I mean, uh, you go all the way back to Strife, the, um, the RPG 3D shooter that uses the Doom engine, which Ben Jander won't shut the fuck up about. Um, <laughs> has you know has has dialogue trees you run up to npcs and uh, you know talk to them and uh, you know everyone who sat down and played that game just went right i'm just gonna this, this is this is a doom engine game i'm just gonna f- run around and shoot everyone and uh, and you know of course the uh, game will punish you for doing that because you're you're actually supposed to you know get uh, objects from these people solve uh, you know missions and such um yeah uh, Fred, you probably have a bunch of you know story-driven non-adventure games to bring up. Well, probably uh, in, in a more modern setting because I I, I kind of tried to think of vintage examples, but I couldn't come up with anything that wasn't you know either Half-Life or uh, incredibly frustrating like Tomb Raider, which features switch flipping, and that's basically <laughs> it. Um, but I've been mentioning games like Mass Effect. Uh, on the show and something that Mass Effect does is that it uh, we we mentioned it uh, on the episode about player choice how you you in in, in the second or the third game you can do things that um, award you either paragon or renegade points you know good points and bad points uh, to to boil it down a bit you know you 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 know what boiling down you can boil down your appearance on this show to basically aristotle and mass effect that's that's all you can tribute and amnesia oh that too and virginia capers Oh, God. But if you no, mash please. all of those together, then you're really going to have a party. Uh, no, well, <laughs> Mass Effect does feature a big narrative, and it features uh, a, a character that you kind of get, not only do you get to define him or her, but you also get under their skin. You know, yeah. they, you you become the character. The character becomes your alter ego. And uh, Scott Murphy and Mark Crow way back when tried to do that with Space Quest. And of course, going back to to before the release of the first Space Quest game, the Serene Encounter, those guys had planned uh, to allow you, the player, to select between a male and a female protagonist. It wasn't always just. Roger Wilco as the face of the male protagonist, you were supposed to be allowed to choose, which is also something you can do in Mass Effect. So it's kind of interesting how history repeats itself in that sense, because not only has Mass Effect received a lot of praise for giving you that choice, um, but I believe the developers have also gone on record saying that the female Commander Shepard is actually the canonical one. So if if you've only played it as a male commander shepherd, then you're doing it wrong. <laughs> well, that's a stretch, but um, I I I agree what you're saying. And you know, going back and looking at old action games, Nintendo games, and such, they they usually had a story. I mean, the first Ninja Gaiden game had you know these amazing cutscenes. Of course, the game was unforgivably hard, but had these amazing cutscenes that actually told the story as you progressed through the levels. Um, but you know what? What I was kind of getting at. I mean, I love I love the way uh, the way you're heading, Fred, and I I, I want to get back to that. But uh, let me just uh, clarify. What I was getting at was that story sort of went out of vogue by the uh, end of the '90s. Like you got Doom coming out in '93 or four uh, ish, and, uh, and then you know Quake shows up, and then uh, Carmack has this infamous line where he says, "Well, story in games is like story in porn. Uh, you know, it's it's there, but it's it's not necessary." Well, I, I care. I care a lot. I do care a lot for whether Ron Jeremy gets that kitchen sink fixed or not. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically what I'm watching this for. So, like, really, really, you're getting distracted here, Ron. And the soundtrack. <laughs> no, that's something worst. different, isn't it? Oh, Man of War is really going at it. Go, boy, go. Oh, yeah. Uh, when when Man of War lost that uh, one race, he lost by a half length. And I'm wondering, what length was that? Well, Ron Jeremy didn't get to fix the sink, but he got 17 stitches. You know who actually won that race? A horse named Upset. <laughs> And some people we, we, believe that that's where the term upset comes from, but that is a misnomer. The term had actually been used for decades before. Yes, yes. I have also read the Wikipedia entry for Man of War <laughs> in preparation for this show. But I, read it, st- I read it back and forth. But that's another story altogether. Really, thank you, Man of War. <laughs> well, Fred, get a Wikipedia entry and we'll read that for next March 29th. I have an yes. IMDB entry, but it doesn't have my birthday on it. <laughs> You really should get on that. 
Nice but yeah, uh, um, story uh, being sort of a thing that you didn't have the space for back in the day. Um, you know, now, now, I'm, now I'm looking at my old, uh, you know, Nintendo cartridges and such. I think I had, you know, uh, early NES uh, RPGs like uh, Star Tropics and such. They had a story that you progressed the through. Zelda games. Yeah, the Zelda games had a story, but it was um, it was kind of hanging around in the background. You weren't expected to pay too much attention to it, and for the most part, they were quite simple stories. I am a hero. I'm going to vanquish something. Well, that can be Not because like, of two reasons. It could be because of technological constraints or because storytelling in an interactive space was in its infancy. I think... Nowadays, with uh, uh, people like Anita Sarkeesian and Brianna Wu coming onto the stage and making Woo! these points about uh, about the role of females in adventure games, those damsel in distress titles, like the original Mario games, uh, are getting a lot of flack. But we should remember that this was a different time, and and you know why not start out with the most simplistic possible stories and i mean there are tons of old fairy tales that are damsel in distress stories so it makes obvious sense to start out with something where you have to attain an obvious end goal wrong yeah, yeah. as it may be to our eyes today oh no 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 i'm not i'm not, I'm not knocking knocking it uh, uh, at all i'm just saying that it for some reason we we got into storytelling in a big way uh, in the uh, mid 80s up to the mid 90s and then well, it sort of well, faded for, out again for some reason this is uh you know that makes it sound like it's not really an explainable progression i think not only is it explainable in terms of we got to know the technology and, and the technology evolved so we got more space for those big stories. But we also learned how to tell a story in an interactive space along the way, which hadn't really been done before. I think that's true. I mean, as as, as a left-wing academic historian, I'm, I'm told <gasps> two ways of not being particularly happy about the damsel in distress um, elements and also... Um, wanting to put them in the historical context, so I think you were you were absolutely right with what you said, Fred. Um, but I, th- right I think Fred. I think right said Fred exactly. <laughs> pointing up the ladder, that oh, wall is going to have to go. I was um, absolutely right, and you were wrong. Exactly. Well, I was going to play that, but I thought it was too obvious. Um, <laughs> I I I can I I think the I I want to think that the technological thing is maybe a bigger part of it than not knowing how to tell the story um, from the simple point that y- if you watch the evolution of Grand Theft Auto from uh, the first Grand Theft Auto 3 engine version, which would be Grand Theft Auto 3, Gareth, keep up, um, <laughs> through to... Which was um, the third in the Grand Theft Auto trilogy. Third in the Grand Theft Auto series. <laughs> uh, yes, and then by by the by the sixth game in the increasingly uh, miscalled trilogy, um, you get if you get to sort of San Andreas and then Grand Theft Auto Four and Grand Theft Auto Five, um, the amount of storytelling in those games increases based on the fact that well now we've moved from CD to DVD, um, better technology for being able to develop cutscenes within the game engine itself um, rather than having to actually film or um, animate uh, through the sort of traditional animation methods, um, cut scenes and various other things. You get that, you get more of the storytelling as the, as the technological things increase because for a lot of the genres that aren't adventure games, the first, the, the, the priority concern, at least up until maybe the mid-noughties, was um, the gameplay itself, the sort of the mechanics of the gameplay as your moving around the world or doing whatever you're doing. But when you get when you get to the late 90s, you have the ability to have um, an open world. You have the ability then to put in cut scenes that can tell a story and link things together. Um, and there's the, because there's more scope for storytelling and, uh, you know, from a... What's the way of putting it? A sort of a, a, a market perspective, it was probably better to be able to tell a story to draw more people in. It gave you the opportunity to bring in um, uh, uh, celebrities to do voices, such as Marina Sirtis. Happy birthday, Marina Sirtis. And so you get that <laughs> opportunity to... And Eric Idle. Happy birthday, Eric Idle. No, he was in an adventure game. Yeah. So, yeah, 
Uh, that that that's my point. I, All right, I, but but which, which okay, I'm I'm actually interested in this. Would you then say that uh, because you know I've 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 seen people who sit down to play a game and they will skip past the opening cutscene, they will skip past any cutscene in the game. They just want to get to the meat of it. And uh, I've I've actually seen people get frustrated and oh my god, now I have to sit back and listen to these twats talk for a bit, and then I then I can get back to my shooting or my questing or whatever. Um, and you know, speed running is an obvious uh, uh, byproduct of that mentality. Uh, not that I'm knocking speed running at all, but uh, it's you know. Uh, so when you've got uh, the technology to start making uh, brilliant cutscenes and animate them and all that, and you've got the space for it, um, would you say that then it's uh, is it is it is it really is it really tech, techno, uh, technology? Sorry, techno. Te- is is it? Is it Skrillex? We should be no. Is, my name is Skrillex. Is, my name is Skrillex. My name is Skrillex. My name is Skrillex. No, my name, no it is not. It's should, it's should, should, should we blame technology, or should we uh, perhaps look at uh, some sort of uh, a societal thing where we are starting to be more interested in storytelling a, and viewing uh, games as a medium of storytelling rather than just a pastime where we get to shoot someone for half an hour and then knock off and uh, you know fix dinner or something? Well, it's it's a very I good point. One. It's a very good point that the balance have have uh, has changed, if I may, and I think that's partly because of Doom as well, because Doom introduced in a major way. A competitive element and we, we'd had that before with like there were probably games before doom where you could do multiplayer maybe primitive networking or you know certainly split screen on on the old consoles and the like but with doom you got a competitive element in a really big way and that has come to stay i think and and i know for a fact there are players out there that prefer just simple competition, you know, just death matching as opposed to playing through a story. Mm. They, they actually yeah, com- prefer Yeah, computer that. game as a sport. It's yeah, a sport exactly. instead, of, instead of a storytelling medium. And in the other end of the spectrum, you have players who prefer stuff like Candy Crush, you know, which is more laid back, more casual, but there isn't that much of a story to offer apart from, from the gameplay. And that's really back to the whole Tetris thing. Mm-hmm, uh, exactly. Maybe there's a bit more of an of an achievement thing going on in a game like Candy Crush where you advance up the ladder and it interacts with your friends through social media. Hi, hello. Um, but, <laughs> but, it, but it's really back to the basics, to that sort of thing. So I, I do think that apart from the fact that over the years technology has allowed us to tell these big stories, it has also kind of brought to light that sometimes history will just repeat itself. You know, no matter how, oh. no matter that you have uh, Dolby Atmos and 3D in cinemas, someone will go out of their way and make a movie like The Artist. Yeah, I, I, I would, I would agree with that. I think, I think it's a bit chicken and egg. The, the ability to tell stories is there. So some people tell stories, and some people like the fact that some people tell stories, and so you get different branches of things um, flying around. And I, I, I would agree with that entirely. I also think that that deathmatch element of it, and that's sort of the idea of a, a game as a, as a game in the sort of the historic sense of the game and that of of what game or sport means in that sort of uh, either mm. competition against other people or kind of a solitaire kind of thing of just trying to solve a puzzle and get to the end i i completely agree with that i think actually i mean i know that this isn't what this episode is about but i think a lot of the angst of those who think people like me who uh, point at an adventure game from the 80s and go, oh, this element might be slightly racist in a modern light. Um, <laughs> what they kind of uh, object to, actually, is this idea that um, that you should treat adventure games like other forms of art, like um, films or, uh, or, 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 or television programs or books or, or any other form of art. And so you get into that kind of, that kind of problem. And I think that storytelling element is one of the things that has drawn people in who wouldn't normally have played other forms of computer game. That is right. true. Exactly, because when I, when I show uh, people, or when, when I just tell people that, you know, I like to play computer games, I mean, the first, I mean, I don't know if it's just me, but I can sort of tell the first thing they think of is, okay, well, he likes to, you know, shout at seven-year-olds over Xbox Live while he's shooting them in the face. And yeah. they go, no, that's, that's not really the type of games that I'm playing. But you would probably and enjoy that. Great, to be honest. You know. it's, 
it's much more enjoyable on the street to shoot a seven year old and laugh at them. Oh yeah, sure. yeah, oh, definitely. Uh, but I, I just I just want to make clear that I'm not I'm not necessarily knocking the idea. I'm not I'm not saying that you know every game should have a story. I, I mean, I, I quite like the multifaceted approach that uh, you know we've got several different uh, types of demographics in computer gaming, and the ones that we are most interested in is of course the storytelling ones. But there are the, there is of course a place for people who just want to knock off for a, for a minute or two while they're on the train playing you know Word Feud or Candy Crush or whatever. Just as there were people with their Game Boys, you know. Sitting around playing Tetris and and you know Prince of Persia, see if they can you know speed run the thing and you know rescuing the princess. Uh, yeah, well, mm, not it so seems, important. It seems to me that that uh, this was something adventure games realized that shit we can actually cater to people who normally wouldn't sit down in front of a computer. You know, Sierra marketed the first Absolutely. Gabriel Knight game as kind of an interactive novel. You know, it was yep. marketed as the adult game it really is as a first. And um, we did Blackout on BSD Plays way back when, and that was marketed as kind of like an art piece. It had a novel to go with it, and, and you know, it would have statements about how this was not a regular computer game on the box, and, you know, it, it certainly isn't, but probably not in the way they uh, they intended that to read. But But this was something that Adventure Games figured out more than most other genres i think they well, they realized say, that we could appeal to different demographics you say that but the, the 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 i mean unlike you two i'm i'm a bit of a sport fan so i, I apologize to everybody who's listening to this you know all all 40 of you um <laughs> who are listening to this and um, yes we've been following the statistics tell your friends <laughs> um and um I, I, I'm a sport fan, so uh, uh, the games. I mean, I don't play them so much anymore. But one of the games that I always used to play and really enjoy um, was uh, FIFA, which is the uh, the football game provo- uh, made by. I, I EA have played EA a lot of FIFA. Sports. FIFA 2000, especially EA oh, Sports. Is it the game? The game. FIFA 2000. Yeah, um, a lot of those uh, 2000s FIFA games. That baby, I played it's a lot all of it. right. The- baby, it's all right. It's only us. And- you know the cuts. Yeah, how much coffee have you shit. had? <laughs> Everybody loves I've the had none, and games. I've had no coffee, and that seems to be the problem. But I, I liked playing my friends when they came round to my house, or I went round to their house on the game. We've all had homoerotic I'm, experiences, but I'll let know. the man talk. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've all had homoerotic experiences with the vibrating controller. The point is that one of the uh, <laughs> one of the modes uh, in the game that. Um, that always captured my attention was the kind of the career mode, which was where you got to take control of a club and you got to take them from the lower reaches up to the up to the higher ends of the game and bring in the players and develop the youth talent and um, you built your own stories around that. I mean, before um, before I joined you, venerable folks, my uh, my main kind of um, people that I used to talk to about uh, about computer games was about a game called Football Manager, which, again, oh, yeah. the thing that drew me into that was the stories of people who had taken these obscure um, these obscure teams from really, like, um, pathetic countries like San Marino or Liechtenstein or Denmark. And if anyone from co- San Marino or Liechtenstein are listening, we're very sorry. If anyone <laughs> from Denmark is listening, go vote for a better party next time. <laughs> But the point was, it was those stories that kind of carried you along. Um, the the wrestling games that come out now, a lot of people just play them to fight with the with the guys that they like the most and beat the people that they like the least. But built um, built into those games is a story mode where you start off as a young wrestler and you have to make your way up through the ranks to become world champion. Stories capture our imagination, even if it's just a way of making the game mechanic, the core game mechanic matter for a longer period of time mm-hmm. a lot love- of people have worked out that you need some kind of underlying narrative to carry that on and it has evolved beyond the princess is in another castle to something a bit more um concrete but that's partially because the technology is there and it's partially because of the demands of gamers how are you going to be able to sell exactly the same game year after year when you're trying to sell a hockey game or a football game or a, uh, an, an NFL game? game. Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. do, I do love your point that these sports games kind of had players or have certainly players create their own stories as well. This is something I would do with FIFA 2000. You know, I would take the Danish national team anno the 1970s, a team I have actually never watched play, and I would try to 
get them up the ladder. You know, I would create this weird alternate history that has never been, and you would you would be able to p- pitch that team against Manchester United circa the 1990s. So um, that, that, that's I like kind I like of interesting. It. I do. I do like the idea of, of you. You know, if if a game doesn't have a built-in story, you can you can sort of make one yourself, which is also you know the power of you know the imagination of of players. <laughs> they sit down and they uh, you know they they. I mean, you could you could look at a, a game with a very very simple story again, Super Mario Brothers, for instance, and just go, okay, well maybe the level itself has a story to tell. It's not entirely obvious, but I can sort of make up my own story as I go. Um, yeah, like 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 cocaine fueled Hollywood executives did when they played Mario, and then went, oh gee, this is Bob Hoskins, and <laughs> and he's fighting Dennis Hopper, and, and they're I all love wearing that latex. Film as a kid. Yeah, Do I mean, not I'm, ruin my childhood, Fred. <laughs> okay, uh, I, 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 if, I you, if, if you love that film, if you love that film, then I would say your childhood was in ruins already. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I, th- I think we've done story a lot, and I think this is probably a topic either for the After Dark or for its own um, episode in season four. We yes, should sir, probably we should probably move on to a different mechanic, and one that um, Trolls is mentioning in the uh, uh, not the After Dark, perhaps the the Pre Dark, the 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 dawning the light. of the show, the dusk, um, <laughs> the dusk of the show, um, was um, the idea of uh, dialogue trees. Oh, yeah. So, um, trolls, please, please re-explain for the for the public consumption uh, dialogue trees. <laughs> Well, it's basically that you walk up to an NPC that you don't want to murder outright and uh, have a conversation with this person and uh, select uh, any number of responses, uh, you know, to what what they're saying. Uh, you know, adventure game fans are are used to this because it is, uh, except for you know larceny and uh, combination of uh, inventory items, it is you know the bread and butter of adventure games. It is conversing with NPCs and learning the uh, bits of information, getting uh, you know objects from them that you can use to further the plot and. So and sometimes they even tag along and help you uh, accomplish goals and such. And I've seen, I mean, I, I mentioned Strife earlier, which is perhaps the first, uh, uh, the first game that I think I know of that was in an entirely different genre uh, where you weren't expecting dialogue trees to pop up. Now, I know, I know someone, someone, someone is going to say RPGs. I mean, Fallout had dialogue trees and, uh, you know, we've had dialogue trees uh, since, you know, Baldur's Gate and, and all of this stuff. Uh, but uh, if you put yourself in an, you know, an action FPS you don't immediately expect to be, you know, locked in a conversation tree with someone. I mean, no, actually, Fallout Fallout Four had, uh, had was ostensibly a, a an RPG shooter and had, you know, extensive dialogue trees for you to kind of you know, begs the in. question: Where did they come from? Did they come from adventure games originally? Because going back to pen and paper role playing, I'm pretty sure that you have some predetermined choices in that. You know, you walk up to a player and what do you want to say? Do you want to say A, B, or C? And then depending on that, you flip to this or that page and the following happens. You know, kind of like that that roll of the dice thing kind of made its way into adventure gaming, didn't it? Well, I suppose you could go all the way back to the first adventure games like Adventure or Zork or something where uh, you could, I mean, uh, of course, Zork didn't actually have any NPCs that weren't out to straight up murder you. But, uh, you know, going back to old uh, interactive fiction and stuff, you could walk up to characters and ask about something, something, something. Not necessarily in a dialogue tree style, but... uh, No, because the dialogue tree kind of has a visual thing going. So we're not talking Mm. about parsers, you know, at least as far as I understand. Understand. No, no, of course not. But what, what I'm what I'm trying to get at is that you're you're in an environment where you're expected to uh, behave according to a certain game mechanic, and FPSs you're expected to shoot things. And if you suddenly switch gears on them and take away, you know, the adrenaline pumping, fast reaction type things, and all of a sudden they lock you into a conversation, that's not uh, well. It's not. It's not straight up, you know, Dooms and Quake style uh, shooting. All of a sudden, you're you're exercising different parts of your brain. You're trying to either convince this person to help you, or you're uh, seeking out information from this person and such. It's you know, flips gears on you, and I like that. I like uh, I like the idea of how that's sort of you know creeping into um, you know other genres than. Uh, adventure games where it fleshes out the story fleshes out the world you get to learn more about the characters they're not just you know cardboard cutouts of people who are in your way 
uh, or, or who deserve a bullet in the brain for some reason, um, they actually have full-fledged personalities. I like, I, like how Fallout, I like how Fallout did it, even though we've now established that dialogue trees in RPGs aren't that unusual. But what Fallout did, which I do think was unusual at the time, is that for a lot of major NPCs, it went into full FMV mode whenever you decided to have a conversation with them. And, you know, th these characters would be fully voiced and fully animated, kind of, I suppose, CG'd, but they kind of looked like puppets. So you, that, that made the whole thing a bit more immersive, because the whole thing otherwise was in this isometric perspective. But you did get those talking heads, and that really helped you to get into the various characters you know this guy harold has a a, a tree growing <laughs> out of his head and he sounds like this and you know whatever mm -hmm. yeah well, I, he's, a, I, he's a full fledged character yeah, sorry go ahead gareth so well i i know that um i, I know that trolls has a, a more strict view of what an adventure game is perhaps than fred <laughs> and i do yeah. so this see, kyle. is <laughs> see kyle indeed trolls see kyle <laughs> happy birthday hitler no, <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's not not this time of year. I don't think it's not um, four twenty no. yet. <laughs> <laughs> really, it's April disturbing 20. that you know that Adolf anyway. Hitler is actually born on April twenty, and the reason I know is because I had a, a classmate in public school, and uh, of course he was named being, Adolf. No, being the little shits that we were, we would make fun of him for being born on the twentieth of April. <laughs> I didn't know it was 420 at that time, you know, I didn't get into that whole thing until a couple of years later. <laughs> you didn't get into neo-Nazism until a lot later. <laughs> no, I was, I was going to mention marijuana, but draw your conclusion. Uh, you, guys, you guys should see Fred with a shaven head, it's beautiful. He's, he's got one of those uh, big swastikas that Edward Norton had in American History X on his chest too, it's, it's fantastic. <sighs> no, You no, say this as I, no. I look at the Skype window and see his eyes boring through me. Um, <laughs> No, I was going to I was going to bring up um uh the tech the first Tex Murphy game, Mean Streets, where you do get that kind of it's not quite a dialogue tree, but you can type in names of things when you meet a character to try and find out what they know about those things. Would you and say then you jump a, your little Would you say it's a dialogue and it's a tree, but it's not a dialogue tree? <laughs> No, that that's a completely different spin-off that we don't mention on here. Oh. Um, well, we do. We want to plug everything that we can at backseatdesigners.com. Um, no, right. the, the, <laughs> no, the 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 kind of the, the point that I was making was that um, Mean Streets is one of those games actually where I think you could. I mean, it's not really a flight sim because the flight sim element of it is pretty crude. And it kind of is an adventure game because you get elements where you are in a room and you need to pick up objects and solve puzzles. But there's a lot going on there. Oh, yeah. Um, it's, it's an amazingly messy game. It actually did start out as a flight sim and then they tried to you know, put a story into it. And then they came up with the adventure elements and they already had the arcade shooting thing, which uh, is just you know, flat out weird and such. It is, mean Streets is, is kind of an anomaly uh, in adventure gaming. Hmm. So I mean, sorry, I completely interrupted yeah, you. Yeah, I, I, well, you did completely interrupt me. But as I was starting to That's make my point, doing I realised that <laughs> as I was starting to to um, you're absolutely right, and I, and I was wrong. <laughs> as I was starting to make my point, I um, I kind of realised that I don't really know how this fits into the conversation, other than saying that messy adventure elements in other games are kind of a thing. Um, hmm. And I have no but idea me, me, where I'm going. <laughs> no, but no, but actually, I, I, I'll try and salvage it for you then. Cause Please. Mean Streets, <laughs> mean Streets is an interesting example because we look at Mean Streets uh, mostly as an adventure game, and you know the story of it being a flight sim first and foremost, and then the flight sim getting pushed more and more into the background, and the adventure elements coming more and more forward is actually uh, you know an an interesting way of flipping the topic around and going, okay, this was one type of game, and now you know we're introducing this element that now becomes the dominant element. Uh, whereas uh, the other examples that we've been bringing up so far are games where the dominant element is either you know shooting or running and jumping, platforming games and such, and they have these little tiny nudges towards adventure gaming. Um, well, I know that, that I think it was on on the Blue t Blue Cup Tools podcast. I got that name right. <laughs> yep. 
Um, in in recent in recent days, they were talking about how they'd been um, playing the demo and actually play testing an alpha of um, uh, Paradigm Adventure, which uh, is by Jacob Jnuk, um yeah. who was. Did you do the on- face? I did do the face. You have to do the face if you're going to say his name. Genuke. As, as you were told from our episode with Jacob Genuke on uh, on uh, Open Crowdsource, BaxiDesigners.com. Backseat design is gone. And um, the <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm I apologise to all our listeners. I'm I'm being very silly today. Um, one of the things that he was mentioning that he really liked about the game, um, which is forthcoming, um, is that it had a lot of elements in that game that have absolutely nothing to do with adventure game, and yet at, by the end of it, you still feel like you're playing an adventure game. Um, which I thought was, you know, if, in, in the context of Mean Streets, is perhaps a good kind of uh, sort of example of a modern game that's doing something similar. Yeah, mm-hmm. well, I mean, uh, there, go, there go are, as far back as Space Quest One, where you have an action element that creeps into a full-fledged adventure game. I was about to mention that, and and uh, yeah, yeah, that, I got that, that first. Well, yeah, um, no problem. <laughs> but that kind of fucking with the formula uh, kind of intrigued me a lot when I played Assassin's Creed Two. Oh, sorry, we're we're, this... us- we're using sire now. We sire with the oh, you know, going back to the whole equestrian thing. Oh, shut up! For God's sake, just shut up! Thank you, Gareth. Uh, I was I was playing Assassin's Creed Two, and there is this sequence where you have to go to a party to assassinate someone, and and it's a, a kind of a carnival. So you it's have to dress, there. yeah, and you have to dress <laughs> yeah. up, and there are all these act- activities, and you actually oh, partake in those. You 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 uh, you chase someone around on the rooftops because that's part of it, and you shoot targets, and that just really astounded me how the game just flipped tables on you and went into this party simulator type thing and of course your eyes were still on the goal all the while while you were doing this you were trying to locate the guy you were supposed to assassinate but i i thought that was interesting and in many ways reminiscent of what space quest one would do and what mean streets would do you know here's a driving simulator <laughs> Mm-hmm. Well, I got I got the feeling from Space Quest, and again, I think we're drifting off topic, so I might try and draw this back soon. Um, I, I got the feeling that Crow and Murphy wanted to tell a story in their game, that they wanted to do this thing with a, a person who was a, a, not a hero in any way. Hashtag not a hero. Through life, hashtag not a hero. <laughs> and it just so happened that they were at Sierra at a particular time, and there was this tool to tell that story. They were at Sierra of the best time, the time of all Ken Williams. But yeah, that's that's a good point, because, uh, you know, Maniac Mansion didn't start out as an adventure game. It started out as a story they wanted to tell, and uh, they didn't know it was it was going to be an adventure game until they actually sat down and, and decided, okay, now we got to program this Actually, fucker. it started out as a band before the lead singer kind of appropriated the net. Oh, wait a second, that was Marilyn Manson, not Maniac <laughs> Mansion. <laughs> <laughs> that was a belabored joke, wasn't it? Okay, no, Twice. I loved it. I loved it. Uh, happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> Happy birthday, Eric Idol. Stalin. <laughs> so, um, what other elements do we have of adventure games that we've seen elsewhere? Ooh, can I bring one up? Yes, do. Oh, yeah. That, that's the one I was saving. Uh, crafting. Because, uh, uh, you know, it's it's kind of a thing that's in vogue. In fact, it, there's already a bit of crafting fatigue going on. As far as I can tell, you know, I actually don't play... <laughs> these games that I'm well, talking about. Well, there are entire games based elements. around it. Minecraft, for instance, is all oh, about yeah. crafting. Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, there are tons of, I mean, uh, you know, games like, uh, I don't know. Um, uh, okay, we'll, we'll one probably game that I ed- we'll, the- <laughs> we'll edit this and we'll just have you read up some titles after recording the episode and we can fly them in there. Nope, no editing. We've Make him, make him fall on his sword, Fred. Oh, all right. You see, Manowar was inducted into the National Museum of Racing and Hall of Fame in 1957. <laughs> I thought you were about to say <laughs> the Museum of Racism. <laughs> the Museum. I'm impressed, top bloke. Congratulations, Drew Blue. Amazing, top wazza. Manowar was a top wazza. <laughs> yep, he was. He certainly was. What a horse. Um, no, I was going to bring up crafting, and I did watch a let's play of a game that some people might know. Uh, it's called um, Don't Starve: Colon Shipwrecked. 
apparently it's a you know a spin-off of another game called Don't Starve and in this game you're you're shipwrecked and you run around it's a survival game you just run around and you pick shit up and you uh, build a fire and you ward off uh, you know monsters that are trying to attack you or like animals and shit and then you and then you craft things to you know build a fire first of all and then you build a you know a pot so you can cook your uh, your dinner and uh, you, you harvest all this shit and you can you know if you got uh, you know like uh, weeds and sticks and uh, whatever the else hell you can craft a hammer or an axe and such and you can chop down trees and get more lumber you know crafting um and I think that's uh, um, uh, inspired or at least, uh, you know, in, in a close relationship with, uh, you know, adventure game inventory puzzles where you combine certain objects to, uh, you know, solve puzzles. And I, I understand in, in, in a survival game like Don't Starve, you're not actually solving puzzles. You're just staying the fuck alive. But, you know, the uh, the concept is the same. You pick up two items that... You can sort of see a connection between, and then your brain goes, oh, I see what would happen if I put these two together, then uh, something, something. Uh, oh, an- another game is uh, The Escapists, uh, which is a, you know, break out of prison style game. Oh, uh, yeah. Top down view. Where you just run around in other people's cells, you know, during, a, uh, you know, yard time and such. And you just break into people's cells and steal their shit. And, you know, people will come up to say and uh, come up to you and say this and this person needs uh, this item or you should go and kill this guy you should craft a shiv and then you can go and kill this guy for me and, and all this stuff Actually, inventory es- combination escape the room uh, games have also become quite popular haven't they i mean there is one called the room not to be confused with the wonderful tommy wiseau movie but uh <laughs> but you got a game classic, pl- absolute classic yeah, absolutely. David X. Newton, actually, David X. Newton, um, who was also on Open Crowdsource, um, on his Backseat channel... Backseatdesigners.com. Backseatdesigners.com. <laughs> he, he played one of those kind of Escape the Room games. that I, I, was, I was fascinated with that. I watched, I watched him play that. I had no desire to do it myself because I think I would have um, thrown something through my monitor. But I had, I, I had a, a whale of a time watching him yeah. <laughs> try and get his way out of these rooms. Yeah, the the game is called Elements, and like like That's you it. said on the like like you said in the episode, it is watching a man crumble before you to watch him play this because because <laughs> he's he's very good at escape the room games, but Elements is just one ginormous game, and it has a lot in common with Mist. There's a lot of you know looking at things and you're poking things, and they don't seem to do anything outright, and you're supposed to decode all this bullshit and such. Has nothing to do with crafting. Has nothing to do with inventory at all. Although you do have an inventory, but uh, yeah, I, I certainly see where you're going. With with that sorry fred we interrupted you. go oh. ahead no yeah. i i don't uh i didn't have anything else to add i think you uh latched onto it and took it on very beautifully oh thank you, thank you. happy uh, birthday fred number one greatest horse in racing horse history by sports illustrated of 1992 <laughs> <laughs> honorary <laughs> inductee at the museum of racism <laughs> <laughs> I can't top that. I mean, you you were talking about um, crafting and putting things together to get towards a story. I mean, one of my favorite games of the past few years has been Kerbal Space Program, where... Oh, good one. uh, Sorry, did we just lose him? Why do we always lose him when he's trying to say something really, really good? Oh, dear Lord. It's always mid-sentence. This is what we get for not mentioning Man of War often enough. Uh, enough. I think I just did. You went away, good doctor, is what I'm now t- typing into the Skype chat. I, I don't Please. think he can read it. I think he's a... Uh, ironically, he's dead, Jim. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, should we give him the boot and uh, re-invite him? Or should we just see if he comes back? We you know, people, people give me shit for, for having a shit connection, and, I and rightly so. I think your connection so. is, is, is uh, quite good today. Which is which is why there's this echo around me because what's happened is that uh, I you know I've, I've you know been tearing my hair out for the past many many months my connection has been absolutely awful. Uh, Fred and I tried to uh, you know do some experiments with how we could continue BSD plays in a more professional manner than just doing it over Hangouts, and uh, my connection was just so awful we couldn't keep a video uh, connection going for any length of time without it completely shitting out on us. Um, so I was tearing my hair out trying to figure out what is causing this awful awful connection. I was phoning up my ISP going, yeah, you fucking bastards and all that. Um, 
and then for some strange, I mean, I, I switched the channel on my router and then I ran a speed test and the speed test inside my living room was phenomenal. I got like uh, almost twice as much speed that I should. Please, ISP, if you're listening to this, don't, uh, yeah, don't listen to this. Um, and, but then, and, 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 um, you know, the DEA don't listen to this. He's not talking about getting that kind of speed. <laughs> no, 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 no. Would never touch that shit. Um, but then I, then I went into my bedroom where I usually record these episodes, um, and the speed was absolutely awful. So, so yeah, apparently, apparently... Your bedroom is a Faraday cage. Yeah, apparently. It's like line or something. So, uh, so what's happened today that didn't happen any other time is that I have now imprisoned my wife in our bedroom. She's having her dinner in there, and she's stuck in there until the show is over. I'm she's, now recording uh, this in my living room. She's doing an escape the room type thing. Welcome back, Gareth. I have absolutely no idea why my internet connection has decided to be an asshole. It has been for a, a while now. I, I, mine just got better, and yours is just getting progressively well, shittier. I, I reached my nadir during our uh, spin-off, Open Crowdsource, <coughs> BackseatDesigners.com. Oh. <laughs> oh, Gareth, you were saying something fantastic. Yeah, you were talking about Kerbal Space Program. Please, please do that again. Uh, okay, yeah, I was talking about... Are, are we editing this, or am I just going? I think we are just going. Okay. Um, I was talking about Kerbal Space Program because that's one of the, the one of these games where you, where you kind of you you start off with only a few kind of tools to um, fire basically a guy in a in a, in a in a seat up into the air and make him fall back <laughs> to the ground. Which was and what they did in the so Soviet glamorous. Union. Yeah, and then you gradually get more and more technology as you do better and better to go to the moon and then to go to um, to the equivalent to Mars and then out further on in the galaxy and all that kind of stuff do you get and, to and explore uranus uh, <laughs> there, there isn't actually an analog for uranus yet although i think that they're, they're planning on introducing it um uh, jupiter is as far as you can go um but the, the idea of crafting what makes that quite interesting aside from just combining inventory items is that there's an element of trying to combine those items in the most efficient way possible for the amount of stuff that you have Mm -hmm. So it might just be as simple as you manage to get one match and one stick of wood and you make a small fire. But it might be that you're able to get a certain number of rocks, a certain number of pieces of wood, uh, a certain amount of kindling and various other sort of elements. And so it's your job to work out what is the most efficient way I can use what I've got to last as long as possible. Mm -hmm. a, so a, lot of, a lot of survival games do this as well. There's um, there's one where you're lost in the wilderness and you have to you know keep a fire going, otherwise your protagonist will freeze to death. And you pick up lumber and shit, and you can craft bigger and bigger fires, and you know all of this stuff. And then you end up building a treehouse or something. And that, and that was kind of my point, really, which which was that it, it it very much is an evolution of using inventory items because there's now an element of using those inventory items in a specific way, which okay, it may be that you go on the internet and you find out the optimal uh, formula for how to do it. But if you're not going to do that, there's a certain element of ingenuity on the player's part of working out the best way of doing it. And actually, the best way of doing it may be completely situation dependent. And that's therefore an evolution because there's more solutions to the puzzle basing, based on the other situations that you're being put in. So um, mm -hmm. my kind of general point was that I, I, kind, of, I kind of like that because it, it very much is an evolution rather than just um, taking an element from adventure games and then importing it wholesale. Yeah, I, I, completely, I have nothing to add to that, which is why I'm talking right now. La, 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 la. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> um, I, have, I actually have nothing else to add. Well, I do have some things that I want to bring up, but maybe we should uh, wait until the after dark for that sort of thing. Maybe, yeah, maybe we should. And maybe if my internet is going to be such an asshole, we should, uh, <laughs> we should decide to uh, end this here. So yep. While the host is still you, around. <laughs> while, while I'm still around, let me tell you, let me tell you, if you go onto Twitter and you go to at BS Designers then we will interact with you. We, we actively seek people tweeting us, uh, giving your opinions. We're there, all three of us. We've all got access to the account. You'll probably get three different replies, completely contradictory, and then we'll get into a fight. It'll yeah. be great to watch. We won't interact we with you to the extent of, say, Manowar, but we, we do our best. <laughs>
<laughs> but so you, please you, go you there. do have to type something at us first, otherwise we won't. I mean, just going there isn't actually going to elicit a response. You have to type something at us. But then we will, of course, you know, jump down your throat. If anything that we've said over this current series seems to uh, tickle your fancy and you really have this burning desire to send in a voicemail, then please do. Voicemail at backseatdesigners.com or if you want the personal touch, Fred at backseatdesigners.com. Either way, Fred gets all of them, so it's nothing to do with me. Please, please spam his inbox. And of course, if you want to subscribe to our show with this show, if you want to look at our past shows, spin-off shows, all of these other kind of things, not all involving me, so if I'm the reason you're not listening right now, you can just go with the Fred and Troll stuff. That's all available at backseatdesigners.com. Actually, we've given that plug quite a few times during this show, so maybe but it's time to... No, but not nearly enough. But not nearly enough. Backseatdesigners.com it is. Go there. <laughs> Please go to Wikipedia and look up Mano War because <laughs> it's his birthday after all. Yeah, it, well, it was his birthday. Yeah, um, it yeah. was his birthday. <laughs> and Written by think, the immensely famous Johnny Loftus. What a jockey. I mean, seriously, that guy. I mean, he was denied a renewal of his jockey's license by the jockey club and uh, was replaced by Clarence Comer, who... Uh, uh, but then, you know, Loftus retired, a really became a trainer. Who had a really suspicious last name for a guy who writes stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's spelled with a K, so... Oh. <laughs> well. What a horse. On that note, on that, on that horse, let's <laughs> say goodbye, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> say goodbye, trolls. <laughs> and on the day we're recording this, one of my personal heroes has sadly passed away, so... That's all we've got time for this evening, so it's good night from me. And it's good night from him. Good night. Good night. Good night. No more for today. Mm-hmm.